Historical Association, and I'm here in Jamesville, New York, for the oral history interview of Karen DeCrow for the Senior Lawyers Section of the Onondaga County Bar Association. Uh, Karen, I know you were a journalist for about 10 years, I think, before... Actually, I suppose it could be said I'm still a journalist because I write a column for the Syracuse Post-Standard. Okay. Yes. Before you were a lawyer, you were a journalist before going to law school. Right. I went to um, Northwestern University. I went to the Medill School of Journalism, 1955 to 1959, and uh, I consider myself a journalist. Actually, I was writing things before I went to college, so I, I consider myself a writer. Quite a bit of writing that goes into being a lawyer, period. That's one of the reasons I love being a lawyer, is the type of documents that we draft, the uh, type of briefs. I find all that absolutely fascinating. But what was it that, that made you become interested in a career in law, to go to law school? Okay, I was very active in the feminist movement from the late uh, 1960s on. And I was thinking, what are the ways to work in the feminist movement? I knew that I was, because of my personality, I was not a rock thrower. You know, I was not, I went to demonstrations and so on, but that wasn't my cup of tea. I figured the perfect way to affect changes against discrimination would be as a lawyer. So that was what inspired me to think about being a lawyer, which in those days was kind of an unusual career choice for a female person. Uh, I was the only woman in my law school class. I was at the Syracuse University College of Law from 1969 to 1972. And if you look at the composite picture of my class, I'm the only female person. So right now, the law schools are half and half, male and female. And when I speak to my law clerks, male and female, about how there didn't used to be women lawyers and women law students. Well, they, pre they feign interest in this, whether they're actually interested. I don't know, but it's like ancient history. Well, the, uh, tell me something about your experience in law school that may make that um, experience come to life with a good story for there I was in the law school, and uh, I was 10 years older than everyone, or than most people, because I was in my early 30s. And I was married at the time, and most of my classmates were single, and they were all male, and I was female. So I was an unusual student at the time. And I have to say, I loved every minute of it. I did feel like a pioneer. Every day when I went to school, I felt, you're a pioneer. Here you are. And many, many of my uh, fellow students were wonderful to me. And some of them are my friends today, years later. Not everyone was wonderful to me. I experienced, I suppose, what someone might say was discrimination, sexism. Uh, the professors, by the way, I never had a female professor in three years. Now there's so many female professors at the law school. It's just, to me, it's thrilling. The dean, of course, uh, Hannah Arturian, is female. So there I was, uh, 
some of my professors were very wonderful to me. I think they liked my interest in the law. I wasn't there just because I had to do something and I didn't like blood so I wasn't in medical school, you know. That, but some of them were uh, quite sexist to me and I didn't let that dissuade me from my career in law school. I loved every course. I, of course, enjoyed it more if the professor was friendly to me or friendly to my ideas. And what I enjoyed very much was a good dialogue. I was um, a champion of the underdog. And uh, as a matter of fact, I take that phrase, champing of the underdog, when there came a time that people could get their FBI files, I wrote away for my FBI file. And I indeed had quite a fat FBI file. Although I, my opinion then and my opinion now is I was never a danger to the security of the United States. I'm an extremely loyal American. But anyway... Uh, the taxpayers paid to have me followed. I have in my file, I was in, at international conferences and there was someone paid to follow me. Um, however, the, the relevance to this conversation is champing of the underdog. Someone was paid at the law school, I have to assume another student, to keep track of me at the law school. And to me, it seemed like a great waste of money. Incidentally, when uh, I got my FBI file, most of it was blacked out, so I couldn't tell who it was who was following me. But one of the phrases that made me so proud was this FBI agent whoever he was. <laughs> he knows who he was, who he is, but I certainly don't. Reported on my speaking in class. I'm a big talker, so I talked a lot in class. I was engaged, let's say. And this report said and she's the champion of the underdog. That would mean, you know, in criminal law, I'd be for the defendant and so on. So that made me pleased, as opposed to the FBI paid agent on the taxpayer's money, was uh, saying she was uh, making foolish statements or something like that. Were you a champion of the underdog because did you feel like an underdog? I suppose I felt females in our culture were underdogs. But many, in many cases that we study in law school, there was somebody without money versus somebody with a lot of money or something like that. They also, they spent a lot of money, they clipped things out of newspapers and magazines about me. And I was thinking, why are the taxpayers paying someone to do this? If they asked me, I'd give them clippings. I would tell them what I'm doing. Because I felt what I was doing was public, not, a, you know, a secret, private event. We're going to skip ahead a bit because there's a question in there that I want to ask that's not on here and then we'll come back to this. But I'm, I'm wondering what, what your FBI report said about your trip to Russia. By the time I went to Russia, uh, that was not on my FBI r report. 
my one thing that was <laughs> really funny, I went to an international women's meeting in Helsinki, Finland, and someone obviously, I think in the U.S. delegation, because they were listening to me, was um, paid to write down what I said. And at this meeting, actually Russians are relevant, but it was not my trip to Russia, there were people from Russia who were attacking the U.S. And what the FBI report said about the Helsinki meeting was she made jokes constantly and everything that the Rus that, that the delegate from the then Soviet Union from the Soviet Union said she was you know telling us all how that was all garbage so I don't if someone wants to read my file I don't come across as a danger to American security U.S. security so after your law school experience, where you did experience some sexism. Oh, lots of sexism. Lots of sexism. Yeah, you're, um, they didn't think that women, for example, uh, Aggressive, people overt. would say, oh no, it hit me. Uh, people would say, you're taking the slot or the position of uh, a a guy who's going to be a lawyer. That was, you know, why are you occupying this position? So I got admitted to the law school on the telephone, which is probably unusual. I decided I wanted to go to law school, and I signed up for the LSATs, the admission exam. And I chickened out, you paid a certain amount to take the exam. I chickened out a couple of times. I didn't take it, although I paid for it. Because, not because I thought I wouldn't be good in law school, but because I felt I'd have to quit my job. And it was, finally I took the LSATs. And I did very well. I'm a good test taker. And so then I called up the law school to find out about being admitted. And the person who spoke to me was very polite, and he said, um, well, the first thing that you have to do is... He apparently knew who I was. They've been following me. I was considered, you know, quite a rabble rouser at the time. Well, you have to take the LSATs. He explained to me what that was. It's a test. And I said, well, I've already taken it. Oh, and uh, did you get your score? Yes, I got my score. And... <laughs> Do you know what your score is? Yes, I know what my score is. What is your score? And when I said my score is whatever the number, he said, you're admitted to the Syracuse <laughs> University College of Law, which was very nice. I didn't have to work real hard for that. I guess at the time, my scores were good for Syracuse University College of Law. I also, in my modesty about my academic talents, I sent away for catalogs from Harvard Law School and Yale Law School. And I didn't apply. I was married at the time, and people lived in the same place where their husband lived. So there wasn't even the thought that I could live in Cambridge or in New Haven. And uh, my husband at the time was working for Syracuse University, and we lived in Syracuse. 
So that was, I had one option, and that was to go to Syracuse University College of Law, which I did. So after you graduate and you begin to practice, what was it like being a female lawyer in central New York in the 1970s? Well, first let it be said that I'm going to graduate, and because I was so well known in the feminist movement, I had several job offers, not in Syracuse. For example, uh, I was offered a job with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in Washington. And that would have been a good fit. But my husband was connected to Syracuse University, so that was not a possibility. And I went into practice for myself because there really weren't a lot of options for me in Syracuse. In other words, none of the big firms were going to hire me. They didn't have females. So, uh, and I felt that I could build a good practice or an interesting practice or an important practice because what I was doing, what I was interested in, what I had studied, was a rarity. Today, many, many people practice employment law, practice discrimination law, practice civil rights law. But when I graduated in 1972, that was not the case. So I felt my career was kind of set up for me. People referred cases to me from all over the country, actually internationally too. So I had from the start a really exciting career. And I speak to many law students. I have law clerks. I'm invited to different law schools to speak to the students. And one thing that I say is, I'll tell you how I built my career, but I can't say you should do the same thing. You were never, the, and you're never going to be whoever you are, the national president of now, where you'll have all these people who know you. So you can't say I'm going to build my career as Karen did. Do, do you think that there were some benefits that you um, enjoyed from, or what were the benefits of a, of a solo career? Were there benefits to having a solo well, career for you? I've been in practice uh, with a really very excellent boss, me, <laughs> since I got out of law school. And the benefits well, first we'll do the detriments, but the benefits far outweigh it. The detriment is I'm not going to become a millionaire. If I had decided to practice corporate law and go and work for a big firm, I could be making lots and lots of money. But... Uh, so that's the main detriment. I'm not going to make as much money. The benefits are extraordinary. I take the cases I want, and to a great extent, I arrange my own schedule. Now, as we all know, in the profession of law, judges decide what's going to happen. So, to some extent, you know, if a judge says you have to come on this day, I have to be there at this time in this place. But to a great extent, I arrange my own schedule. And something that is such a luxury, I know my many, many of my friends and colleagues work for big firms, and they have to take the cases that the firm takes. 
I don't. And I take cases that appeal to me. The main type of case that appeals to me is something that's going to change the law or change the practice of law. But sometimes I do lots and lots of pro bono work. Sometimes I just feel this is something I should be I should be doing. But usually it's an intellectual decision, not that this person has been wrong. Very often when someone has a very sad fact pattern, I don't think I could do anything about it. So I say, you know, my heart breaks for you, but I'm not going to spend your money and my time and your time on something that I don't think is going to go anywhere. Has there ever been a case that you turned down that you later wished you hadn't? That's a good question. Probably the answer is yes, but one of the things I do in my life is I don't spend a lot of time on regrets. So, (laughs) that's... um, I don't sit here and say, oh, if I had only, you know, taken this case. I can say I have taken many cases that I wish (laughs) I hadn't because, you know, it turned out I feel terrible saying this. The client had not been completely honest with me, and there were many problems with the fact pattern that I was not aware of. And I would say then to the client who, this is perhaps somewhat humorous, I do a pretty good interview with a potential client and try to figure out what happened. And then, you know, a year or so down the road we're perhaps in court and what, or we're at a deposition. And what the client has told me is different than what I'm hearing at the deposition or heaven forbid, in court. And so then, during a break, I'll say, oh, Ms. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so, when I asked you, had you ever had a uh, negative job evaluation, you told me, oh, my job evaluations are wonderful. And now, uh, you've given a different answer, and what's the reason for that? I say as pleasantly as possible. And what I would hear over the years is, well, I had to swear on a Bible that I would tell the truth. So, and you know, I don't want to go to hell or something like that. So, now when I'm talking to a potential client, I bring out a Bible. And I say, obviously, I'm not going to have you swear in a Bible. But I want to tell you that when opposing counsel or a judge asks you questions, they're going to swear you in on a Bible. And so just pretend I've done that. Another answer I get when I get a different set of responses, when I have gotten a different set of responses, let's say the person has been several times in a mental hospital, and I didn't hear a word about that. You know, I'll say, let's say the theory that the client has is things were so 
horrible at work that they drove me to a psychiatrist or to a mental health facility or something. So that's what I te- that's what I say to opposing counsel. You know, Mr. So and so, you made her crazy. Okay. But then Mr. So and so tells me, Well, did you know that she's been in and out of mental institutions several times? So then, and I never do this on the phone, I call in the person because I want to see, you know, I want to see the reaction. I say, is there some reason that you didn't, when we talked about how this employment situation was so stressful, uh, you never mentioned that you had several times been in mental institutions. Is there some reason that you didn't tell me that? And then I'll hear, well, I thought, Karen, if I told you that, you wouldn't take my case. Well, you might be right. But, so, uh, that, I guess, I it's been an adventure. It continues to be an adventure. The last time I spoke to a potential client was yesterday. So, so how has the law, uh, practice of law, for women changed in the past 35 years? In the past 35 years, it's been a revolution not an evolution. It has been completely different. There are women now go to law school when we didn't used to. Uh, Women practice law. Women are in every type of legal practice in these big firms that never had female associates heaven those partners that's all history and they're making accommodations for well some of the big firms some of the Wall Street firms have what's called a breast pumping room okay this is for nursing mothers to either nurse their babies you know, when the nanny comes running in a taxi with the baby. Or else, breast pumping sounds like what it is. You know, they are pumping out breast milk. And when I think about that, you know, a couple of decades ago, I mean, no one would believe that. So the practice of law has changed. Women are now... uh, Women are law students, women are lawyers... Women are judges. Women are deans of law schools. How about the um, treatment of women in the law? Uh, how has that changed from their uh, from male counterparts over the years? Were you taken seriously? You know, etc. Are they now? Well, of course, there are many people, and they have many different kinds of experiences. Mm-hmm. So I can't generalize uh, from invisibility to being present is a dramatic change. And I'm sure there's a lot of sexism. I hear it from colleagues in law firms and in legal situations. But it's getting much better. And I have nothing but hope for what's coming down the pike. I also feel that we in the feminist movement made such a dramatic change in a couple of decades. If one studies history, and I read a lot of history, most social and cultural and economic and political change took a lot longer than the change on 
the status of women and girls. You've been involved in the feminist movement for a long time, and before you were a lawyer. Correct. How sort of the impetus for my becoming a lawyer? Sure. I think you know. Um, there's you know a question here. You specialize in discrimination, employment, and civil liberties, and you know the question is to how did you decide to choose those fields? But I think no, the field chose yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was why I went to law school. In right. other words, I didn't go to law school uh, to be a corporate lawyer, to be a tax lawyer, or to be a real estate lawyer. I went to law school to make changes uh, on the gender issue. And incidentally, I've had dozens and dozens of male clients. There is a lot of discrimination against men, which I have been happy to deal with. How is the fact that you've been uh, famous in the feminist movement, active in the feminist movement, or well-known or infamous? <laughs> famous or infamous. How has that helped you, and, and how has it hindered you? Well, mostly it's been a help because there's an automatic client base. That people know who I am. And people know who I am in places I'm very surprised. You know, someone comes up to me. So that's the advantage. As far as the disadvantage, I'm sure some people think that I'm a wild-eyed, radical nut and therefore wouldn't deal with me. Now, I have had some very, uh, I think, entertaining experiences. I've done a lot of age discrimination. And many of the people who have experienced age discrimination are white males who are getting fired right and left when they're 50 years old because of someone the employer hires someone half their age, they pay them less money. And, okay, so somebody calls me, makes an appointment, comes to see me, and his opening remark, and I've heard this not once, not twice, a lot of times, Mr. Crow, I always thought the last person in the world I would ever call is you. And I'm a good-natured person. I say, ah, and Mr. So-and-so or Professor So-and-so, whoever. And how come you were reduced to doing that? And he says, well, when I told people about what had happened to me, they all said, you should really go see Karen DeCroix. So... I have represented, in age discrimination cases, many men who at first were quite nervous about me. And I always say, you know, I can't fire you unless it turns out you were lying to me or something. But you can at any point say, I would like to end this relationship and it's over. But I haven't lost clients on that basis, I have to say. It, it, any way that it's hindered you, your, your <coughs> role as a nationally known feminist? Well, it probably has or it possibly has, but I can't think of how has it hindered me. I suppose some judges have looked askance at me and uh, had a preconceived notion about me. One thing that I've heard many, many, many times is from lawyers, other opposing counsel, I can't believe how friendly you are. And 
how non-combative you are. And I really, on the big issues, I won't compromise. On the little ones, in a minute. You know, someone calls me up and says, I want to change the day. I say, fine. And you can hear, you know, they're surprised. But, or we go to a conference with the judge and the judge wants to set up some event. And opposing counsel says, oh, I didn't bring my calendar, whether it's a on, you know, electronic device or a paper calendar. And of course, I could say, dummy, we came here for a scheduling conference. How come you don't have your schedule? But I don't. I say, <coughs> well, how should we arrange this? You know, should we make a tentative date and then someone will call me? In other words, I'm just as sweet as can be. And I think they're kind of surprised. But I concluded long ago, when I became a lawyer, that it was hard enough that I was female. It was hard enough that I was well known as an activist for women's rights. And I wasn't going to also be tough and nasty. So that was... That's sort of my stance. 1974, you were elected the national president of the uh, National Organization for Women, NOP. And I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that experience. Being elected or being president? or um, uh, I was the I fourth national president of NOW. The first was Betty Friedan, the second was Eileen Hernandez, the third was Wilma Scott Heidi, the fourth was Karen DeCrow. And I had been on the board of NOW, National NOW, and I always thought it, I would love to be president. You know, I, I love to be the head of things because you get to make policy. So there came a time that I ran for national president of now. There had been a nominating committee and they nominated someone else. But according to the bylaws at the time and Robert's Rules of Order and so on, you could run up against or opposing the nominating committee's official candidate, which I did. So, I was elected national president of, La of now. And I adored it because, well, I did, there was a lot of infighting in the organization. I didn't adore that. I found that tiresome. But uh, what I liked was I was instantly on the national map. So, if I called up Senator so-and-so, who was head of some committee I wanted to testify or something, before I was national president of now, someone would say, well, he's in conference and, you know, in other words, I'd get the brush off. We've all called, made phone calls. I'm national president of now. I'm in all the newspapers. Every word I say is, you know, the Associated Press is recording it. And uh, hold on, please. And, you know, two minutes later, their senator so oh, Mr. Crow, you know, so good to talk to you. And so suddenly, I'm, I became a national figure, which I enjoy. And I have to say that's still true, I think. And this sounds immodest, but I feel... If I want to meet with someone, chances are they'll meet with me. If I want to talk to someone, chances are they'll speak to me on the phone. And that is not true of most people. It's not because I'm smarter or it's not because I'm even pushier. It's because I'm 
well known, I guess. And you think now, sort of, wrap that up a notch or two or three. Now created that for me. I was the national president of a very well-known national organization. So that's how that happened. I became overnight a well-known figure. So that's what it did. I'll give you an example. Okay. I'm <laughs> and uh, you politely haven't mentioned it. How come uh, you took your husband's name? I was married twice. Each time I took my husband's name. At the time, I didn't think there was any alternative. So anyway, I'm Karen DeCrow. That's a husband's name. My name when I was growing up was Lipschultz, Karen Lipschultz. Uh, I, and at the t- time we're speaking, I was in the process of getting divorced from my second husband, Mr. DeCrow. And I don't know what the law is now, but in the process of getting divorced in those days you could put into the divorce decree that you were going to go back to your I guess they called it maiden name and you didn't have to do a bunch of stuff you just put it in and I was thinking I should do that so at the time we're speaking, I was it was in the process I was going to get a divorce. My intention was to go back to be Karen Lipschultz, the brilliant elementary school student I had been. And I was in France, and I read in the listing in the newspaper that there was going to be a meeting of French feminists or French women's rights activists or whatever and they always listed what metro station how to get there so anyway I went to this meeting and it was partly held in French which was difficult for me to follow but it was partly held in English the meeting's over and I figure I will go up to the people running the meeting and tell them, introduce myself, say I'm an American and I'm here for some other purpose and I was so thrilled really to come to this meeting. So I go up and I give my name and this person in Paris said, Karen de Crow. Oh, you know, I've read your articles, I've read things, your books, and I think to myself, don't change your name, stay to crow, you know, I mean, if here you are, across the pond. So I I never changed my name back to Karen Lipschultz, I have been Karen to crow. And that was kind of the, the reason. I figure, well, they know who I am. Why should I lose my identity again? You know. Has a nice ring to it as well, though. Don't what Karen De Crow? Yeah. Well, there are very few De Crows. K K. Oh. K to K. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. At any rate, that's what now did for you. Made me. Right. Uh, <coughs> well, no, yes. How do you think now fared under your leadership? This is very immodest. And I think some people who think about the history of now would agree and some people wouldn't. I think now fared very, very well. I had many, many things I wanted to accomplish. Some of them I accomplished, some I didn't. For example, I I felt we had to attract more persons of color. 
And so I was very instrumental in setting up an affirmative action program. I'm delighted about that. We, that occurred. I also felt, now had meetings all over the country, and if you wanted to be on the board of now, or an off, be an officer of now, you had to get yourself to the meetings. How I got myself to the meetings, interesting little aside, I have been lecturing at colleges and universities since the late 60s. And how that got started was necessity is, you know, the mother of invention. I wanted to go to the now meetings. And I, well, let's say when I was in law school, I didn't have any dough. So let's say now had scheduled a meeting in Arizona. At the time, nothing was online. You found out what the colleges were in Arizona by looking in the dictionary, you know, they listed the colleges. So I would type out a polite little letter to every single college. I would say, I am interested in being in Arizona in March, whatever the year, and I wondered if you would like me to speak at your college. At the time, I never asked for a fee, which I certainly do now. Uh, if you are interested, please, you know, call me. And what I wanted was a plane ticket to Phoenix. That's what I wanted. So, I don't think I ever missed a board meeting. I would get these gigs, and I would get plane tickets. And then at some point it occurred to me to charge a modest fee, and then, you know, I kept upping the fee. But I don't know if I would have had this really good career of speaking at colleges and universities if I hadn't needed the plane ticket. So um, that's, that was an advantage to, now some people, I digress, you asked what were some of the results of my presidency. Some people didn't feel they could run for the board because they couldn't afford to pay the transportation. In those days, plane tickets were much less expensive than they are now, but if you don't have money, you don't have money. So I ins pushed for, and I feel was very instrumental in getting a program in now where you could put in for your expenses and get them paid for to go to meetings and committee meetings and so on. And if you didn't need the money, you just didn't submit your expenses. So the main argument was, well, wealthy people or well-heeled people will be taking advantage of it. I said, well, I don't think anybody wants to get rich on now. And uh, which didn't have much money, I can assure you. But let's just assume that people who could afford it wouldn't put in their expenses. So that was something I was very proud of. So there's the race issue, there's the economic issue. I was a very big early promoter of gay rights in now. That was, I think, where I got most of my negative. People were furious. I, there were several reasons that I was so adamant about this. Uh, the first was this was discrimination and now it's against discrimination. 
Another reason was I felt then, and I still feel, that most of the discrimination against gay men and lesbians is because these persons are not playing their proper sex roles, their proper gender roles, which is so inherent in our culture that, um, well, that's what we're about in now. We want to change proper sex roles or expected sex roles. So I felt we should be allies with the gay rights movement. And there was a lot of fury about that. I, uh, the bylaws then stated that the national president, in between board meetings, could act on her own. In other words, you, if it couldn't wait two months, board meetings for every two months. I think right now there's not that much freedom. But um, so there came a time when there was um, a bill proposed by Bella Abson, the late Bella Abson, to include sexual orientation in the laundry list of discriminations. And she invited me to come to a press conference to support that. <laughs> and it was between board meetings, so I went. And of course, it was in all the newspapers, and people just went crazy. How could you do that? But I did it. One thing I tried to do, and I failed, okay? I felt now should um, be gender neutral, and the board should be half male and half female. And we have always had some males on the board, but nothing like 50-50 representation. So I tried to p get past a 50-50 representation rule, and it absolutely failed. People thought it was awful. So that was not a success. I'm always very pleased that Greater Syracuse now has attracted many male members. <laughs>